In the beginning of the 20th century, the inhabitants of the village of Arc et Sonon used to have themselves photographed on Sundays in front of a local monument. An imposing and unusual edifice, with its Doric columns, its artificial grotto, its barracks-like buildings surrounding a sort of temple. Everything here seems to be written in a mysterious tongue, and yet it is just a factory where they used to extract salt, a salt works. It was built in the second half of the 18th century for the King of France, Louis XV, who gave his personal approval to the plans. It was finished in 1779, just 10 years before the French Revolution swept away the Ancien Régime. Its architect was both a courtier and a practical man, pragmatic yet a visionary, Claude Nicolas Ledoux. He was the royal architect and a favourite of the enlightened aristocracy, as well as the world of high finance for whom he built chateaux and town houses. As a philosopher architect, he was persuaded that architecture alone could relieve a suffering humanity. Or, as he put it in his own particular way, there is no one on earth incapable of being saved by an architect. Ledoux wrote at length of his ideas in a testamentary book, Architecture Considered with Respect to Art, Customs and Legislation. In it, he described buildings he could only dream of, like this house that bridges a river, or this workshop destined for Coopers, as well as others that he actually built, like the theatre at Besançon shown in this engraving. The Salt Works occupies a primordial place in this book, which constantly and without warning crosses the line between the real and the imaginary worlds, where architecture should be read like a storybook. In 1771, Ledoux was appointed as the inspector of salt works for the Franche-Comté region, a lucrative job. Salt was a real monopoly and one of the principal sources of state revenue. In Franche-Comté, salt was extracted from underground saline water sources that had been exploited since antiquity. The most important of them was in the town of Salin. But by the end of the 18th century, this exploitation was in crisis. The steep slopes around the town prevented enlargement of the factory and modernization of salt production. Moreover, wood which was vital to salt making was running short in the area. Working on the principle that transporting salt water was much cheaper than carrying wood, Ledoux decided to bring the water to the forest through a 20 kilometer long canal that would transport part of the underground source from Salin to the Lalu River plain near to the great forest of Chaux. There was enough space and wood there to build a new salt works from scratch that would be both monumental and practical. It was to include a central building for the administration and management of the factory, surrounded by two workshops, known as Bern, in which the salt would be made and two pavilions for the tax clerks. The workers and their families were to be lodged on site in four buildings built to the same plan. Entry would be through a monumental portico surrounded by a wash house, a bakery, the guard post and the prison. The semicircular plan of this positive industrial city brings to mind a theatre of antiquity. The director's pavilion and the workshops are set on the diameter like a stage to which all eyes converge, while the dwelling houses are turned towards the scene like so many spectators. This is a plan drawn by a geometer, the unique interpretation of the architect's vision, 
his symbolic, even mystical, preoccupations. This semicircle, said Ledoux, is in the same form as the celestial vault, a form as pure as the course of the sun. It is also a completely rational plan. On the diameter of the semicircle, the architect has aligned all the buildings concerned with production that go to make up the factory proper. But where classical architecture would have gathered everything into one building, Ledoux has on the contrary segmented the factory into autonomous elements. He did the same for the dwellings for reasons of safety and hygiene. By spacing the buildings out, he lowered the risk of fire and aired the salt works by opening it up to the winds of heaven. A boundary wall encloses the 11 buildings and provides the architect with space for waste disposal, where he could hide anything that might clutter the central semicircle and spoil the view. Behind the workshops lay the stocks of wood for making salt, and behind the lodgings were gardens for the workers. This wall made the salt works into a closed world, protecting the royal manufactory from malice inside or out, from thieving workers and smugglers, and from brigands and deserters seeking refuge in the forest of Shu. Facing the forest, the factory has the air of a fortress, an outpost of royal authority in a hostile territory. At the front, on the contrary, the wall seemed to open. The architect made it disappear into a sort of esplanade in front of the central building of the perimeter. By setting it back, he enhanced the value of the monument, ornamenting the entrance to the works. A majestic portico resting on eight imposing columns. This is a regal entrance for a royal factory, but at the same time it is no more than a works entrance. The portico is just decoration affixed to the central building that the architect had quite simply chopped off abruptly at the back, without seeking to arrange or dissimulate the brutality of this juxtaposition. Ledoux defends this treatment. For him, building is a case of assembly, not modelling. His art is the art of contrast and disjunction. Once past the columns, there is a jumbled pile of sculpted stones, a second decor, a grotto, one of the artificial grottos that were much called for in 18th century gardens. This is theatre. The white columns of the portico form a curtain before the grotto and create the surprise of its discovery. Le Doux considered that the grotto was the incarnation of the subterranean sources of the town of Salins, and also a primordial chaos and the struggle between light and the tenebrous forces of dark. It was a start of a pathway of initiation whose mythical references would speak to a cultivated visitor. But it was at the same time a real pathway, the only way into the complex, a control point where the workers were searched on leaving to make sure they had not stolen any salt. After the grotto, the visitor to the works finds himself in an empty, out-of-scale space, with the impression that it is impossible ever to escape the eye of authority. The semicircle is also a sinister figure for surveillance, symbolized by the large roundel piercing the pediment of the director's pavilion like a giant eye. The surveillance here is more symbolic than real but Ledoux thought it was one of the irrefutable trump cards in his plan. Nothing can escape the surveillance placed at the central radius, he wrote. It has a hundred eyes open while another hundred sleep, and their keen pupils ceaselessly light the unquiet night. His keen pupils are in fact two large lanterns that were designed to illuminate the salt works at night, but which for reasons of economy were never built. Nowadays, the prison-like dimension of the salt works is all the more striking because there is none other like it. The increasing use of coal soon deprived the factory of its principal economic advantage. The salt works declined. 
passing from one owner to another until it finally closed in 1926. And all the memories of a century and a half of industrial activity and working life were effaced by the successive misadventures of the buildings. They became in turn ruins, barracks, then a concentration camp for gypsies in the Second World War. At last, they now form a cultural centre. Not so bad, perhaps, considering that there was talk of turning them into silos for grain. Now the buildings have been restored faithfully to the original Ledoux design, but only on the outside. For the inside, we have only the plans and comments of the architect. For example, we know that the housing for the workers and their families were intended to have a communal kitchen built around a large hearth in the central pavilion, whereas the families lived in the two wings. But today these houses are just empty shells where only the roof timbers still bear the traces of human habitation. In the main workshops where the salt was made, even the roof beams have disappeared replaced in the 30s by concrete arches. We still have the enormous volume of this continuous roof that once was lost to sight in the swirls of vapour and fumes. The salt was obtained by evaporating the salt water heating it in eight big pans with fires that burn day and night. The heat was over 140 degrees Fahrenheit. It was probably a hell for the people working there. But Ledoux left us this elevation that shows the building, the broiling steam and smoke without any sign of human intervention. The ideal factory, one without workers. And apparently without chimneys. In fact, the architect disguised them. Smoke and steam were evacuated by the dormer windows. There remains the excessive size of the buildings. Far from being anecdotal, this is at the heart of the project and of the architect's endeavour to give a monumental character to such a large site with only limited means. How was he to deck out the factory? The vital question for industrial architecture. A sole decorative motive relieves the bare walls of the salt works. A tilted urn pours water that we imagine must be salt. Figuratively naive, perhaps, but possessed of singular strength by its very sobriety. The total absence of any transition between the masonry and the sculpture makes the urns thrust out from the flat surface as if they are bursting through the wall. But more than the urns, there is the rustication, stonework standing out from the bareness of the walls with enhanced jointing to become the real decorative element of the salt works. A simple motif, set off by the play of light, that Ledoux used to emphasise the things that counted in his opinion. The windows, but only those in the principal façade, the ones at the back were just openings. The angles that the rustication heightens and seems to give strength. The central pavilion of the dwellings, whose rustication underlines their preeminence over the wings. Ledoux wrote, if you want to be an architect, start by being a painter. All those variations that you will find in the inactive surface of a wall, that is what an artist can do when funds are limited. From this, the only relief work in the stone, Ledoux was able to indulge his obsession for creating effects capable of rivaling the gigantic scale of the salt works, like these projections of the buildings, that by taking the light, break the massive monotony of the workshops and make a strong impression from a great distance. And in the opposite way, when the distance is short, as is the case with the pavilions for the tax agents, stuck on at the far end of the workshops. The architect had no hesitation in hollowing out a niche in the façade, just enough to give an illusion of depth. 
the great effect obliged by viewing from a distance is replaced here by detail work with variations in the texture and colour of stone and brick. In this way, each building is given the treatment appropriate to its function and rank. This is an ordered world in which the dwellings encircle the salt works rather like the good workers gathering around the communal hearth, while the smoke from the common chimney mixes with the steam from the factory, rising together to reach the clouds. Just so, productive man plays his part in the great cycle of nature. He takes the water from the earth, transforms it so that it mounts skyward, ready to fall again to the receiving earth. Like all European architects since the Renaissance, Ledoux paid particular attention to columns that are the incarnation of the essence of learned architecture founded on the antique model. And like his colleagues, he used the column to mark the exception. At the entrance to the salt works, he used Doric columns that are symbolically associated with the birth of architecture. But to emphasize the exceptional status of the director's pavilion at the heart of the enterprise, he had to find something other than the columns already seen. He turned his back on the classical orders. The columns that he invented for the director's pavilion represented a new order, the only one according to him that suited industrial architecture. Only the onset of madness, wrote a critic at the time, could explain these fantastic assemblages, these barbarous porticos. Barbarous here meant, if we are to understand correctly, the opposite of the column with a polished shaft and invisible joints. Ledoux's columns are presented as a simple pile of alternately round or squared stones. Ledoux considered the circle and the square to be the two key letters of the alphabet of creation. This simple alternation of light and shadow generates a complex design that is at once rich and sober, being imposing without unnecessary expenditure. The sides of the building are completely bare. Economy once again, but this time it was imposed. In his earlier plan, the director's pavilion was completely encircled by columns and pilasters, but that was too expensive, and Ledoux had to abandon the surrounding columns and the imposing upper story that should have crowned the edifice. Only the monumental façade was saved. Without columns, the rear of the building has the banal appearance of a factory wall. In spite of being the most important building, it too had to bow to the imperatives of production. Ledoux had intended to have wide canopies along the workshops to shelter the wood and salt from bad weather during transport. But to go from one workshop to the next meant going outside and round the director's pavilion. Never mind. To restore a rational and sheltered route, Ledoux simply made a covered carriageway straight through the middle of the director's pavilion. The director's pavilion is in fact where the project's lines of force cross. On one side is the rational production line on the diameter of the semicircle, and on the other is a symbolic line linking the two colonnades, a path of initiation that starts with a grotto and ends at a temple. Because inside what was called the director's pavilion, the earthly director took up very little room. 
The whole central volume of the building is hollow. It is the nave of a church where the workers of the salt works gathered for prayers every Sunday, marshalled onto the steps of the great stairway that during the time of Ledoux stretched from wall to wall, but of which there remains today only a poor semblance. The priest stood at the top of the sixty steps. In a commentary to this engraving, Ledoux wrote that the divergent light must be destroyed, those accessories that attenuate and divide the impression of the main lines, to induce reverence in the faithful. The light falling upon the sacrificer had to reflect grandeur and supreme majesty. The window that let in this light is still there, and just below, one of the smallest buildings in the salt works are the director's stables. Ungrateful humanity, when will you recognize all that you owe to the animal world, the architect wrote of this building. The stables are placed on the same axis as the grotto and the temple. This is another passage that leads to a final door that opens onto a quite different dimension of the project. In the fields where today the trains pass on the way to Besançon, the architect had planned to build a town, a new city, a city made for the country, rid of all the defects of wretched cities, of real cities. The city was to close the circle as an urban complement to the factory. Ledoux drew the plans of this ideal city of Chaux, with its principal buildings, the Temple of Memory, the graveyard, the brothel, the Royal Artillery Works. In 1789, the revolution cut these projects short. In prison for a year, Ledoux was lucky to escape the guillotine. But his career was ended. He built nothing more before his death in 1806. The 19th century understood neither his classicism nor his modernity. No longer decipherable, his work appeared to be merely eccentric and fell into oblivion. Ledoux had to wait for the 20th century to be rediscovered. He was made into a prophet of the modern movement, a forerunner of Le Corbusier. With historic irony, at the moment of this late recognition, the salt works was coming to the end of its life. On the 29th of April 1926, the last owner, furious at the decision to class the buildings as an historical monument, dynamited the portico of the director's pavilion. This act of vandalism marked the start of the reconstruction of the site as it can be seen today. A large body, with its substance removed, an imposing and astonishing work, but oddly dispossessed of its own history, as if the very excessiveness of this architecture and its object denies the possibility of anecdote the simple human touch. When he laid his plans for his ideal city, Ledoux made slight changes to the environment to hide a sort of graphic rebut in the countryside in the form of the animal shapes that, according to Vitruvius, should preside over the foundation of a city. The hare, the crayfish, the whale and the dog. If the animals had so desired, we would have lived in another world. The pillars of the bridge over the river are dismasted ships. The school would present pupils with columns, galleries and windows. The village dead would lie in peace within a great half-buried sphere while the living would benefit from the architecture while they did their shopping. And all the while, the security camera in the eye of the director's pavilion would watch the clouds pass by. <laughs> 